Good evening. My name's Judy Wiseman. I, it's my pleasure to welcome you all here. I'm the head of the sociology department here at the LSE, and I'm welcoming you um, to the Martin White inaugural lecture to be given by Professor Nicholas Rose. Um, the title is up there, The Human Sciences in the Age of Biology, Revitalising Sociology. I must say it's very hard for me to summarise in just a few words the enormous impact that Nicholas's work has had on British sociology and social theory. And he did ask me not to give a long extended introduction, of course. But I do want to say that his books have influenced a whole generation of sociologists and their reach is really incredible. I've come across academics, even in the Australian bush, quoting from his book, Governing the Soul, The Shaping of the Private Self. So I wasn't at all surprised to find that he is the most cited sociologist in Britain, which is just a fabulous achievement. He's written many, many um, splendid books, been involved in leading journals such as Economy and Society, and in 2003, Nicholas established and has directed BIOS, the Centre for the Study of Bioscience, Biomedicine, Biotechnology and Society. And during this relatively short time, the centre has really established a huge international reputation. So I think that's also a fantastic achievement. Finally, may I say that I'm doubly delighted really to introduce this uh, lecture as I'm currently president of the Society for the Social Studies of Science. And with that hat on, I really want to emphasise that the issues that Nicholas is dealing with are really at the core of what social science today should be about. That is what it is to be human in the 21st century. So I, it's really a great delight to introduce Nicholas to give his lecture and there'll be a little bit of time, I think, um, at the end for some questions and some answers. Thank you. Thanks very much, Judy. I'm delighted that you agreed to chair this lecture. It's very appropriate since uh, I am going to say things which I hope may have some uh, relevance both to uh, my discipline of sociology and to the social studies of science and technology. And I'd like to thank so many of you for coming tonight in the face of stiff competition. Uh, David Miliband, uh, talking just down the road here at the LSE, International Women's Day, Pancake Day, and of course, a uh, match between Arsenal and Barcelona, which I know many of you would have much preferred to see. So this lecture is for all of those who've collaborated in the project that is now called BIOS. It's for my brother and sister-in-law, Stephen and Hilary Rose, unfortunately not able to come here tonight because of ill health, whose powerful criticisms of biologism in the social sciences have opened a space or drawn a line uh, which I hope has allowed me, uh, the little brother, to say something a little different. And it's also for two remarkable intellectuals, transgressors of all disciplinary boundaries, Roy Porter and Paul Hurst, who for unaccountable reasons at, at the very beginning of my bizarre career, um, held out uh, their hands to me and supported me with enormous generosity. Um, they both knew a great deal about the relationships between the biological and the social, and I learnt a huge amount from them. And uh, it's a great sadness to me that neither of them can be here today to learn what a mess their pupil has made of uh, everything that they taught me. But uh, Paul and Roy, you're much missed. So my work over many years has centred on one question. What kinds of creatures do we think we are, us human beings? And two questions that flow from that. How have we come to understand ourselves in these ways and with what consequences? The social and human sciences have had their own views about the nature of the human beings whose social lives they study. But once again, they're having to negotiate their relationship with biology. 
biology as the field of positive knowledge of living beings that we give that name, biology as the reality of those beings themselves, humans who are, after all, animals, living creatures, primates, with affinities with such, with other such creatures who are born, live, sicken, and die. Now, to think of the human as animal has long been associated with determinism, reductionism, fatalism, the naturalization of human delinquencies from sexism to warfare, and with a bloody legacy of horrors from racial science to eugenics. But I'm going to suggest to you this evening, it can be reposed. Contemporary biopolitics centers on questions of human vitality, of human rights to life, of the equality of all human beings as certain kinds of living creatures, and what can be done to the lives of some to facilitate the lives of others. And yet, at the same time, a radical movement in philosophy is rethinking the place of the animal in contemporary thought, rethinking the human-animal distinction. Now, neither of these will be my focus tonight. Rather than look to philosophy, I prefer, prefer to look to the conditions that have led to this reframing of the human. And of course, there are multiple, notable, notably the many challenges to the ways in which humans have claimed and exercised dominion over this planet. But I think we can find at least three of these conditions within biology itself. For, and I just want to single out those three. First, the remarkable flowering of the knowledges, the know-how, the technologies of the biological sciences, of molecular biology, genomics, neuroscience, synthetic biology, converging with the digital world of information technology with its capacity for processing, modeling, and much more. Research in genomics, in biomedicine, and in the use of animal models for human capacities reveals multiple affinities between humans and animals and reposes the question of our distinctiveness. <clears throat> Further, these developments embody a new style of thought, a molecular gaze in which life processes are anatomized at a molecular level and in which vital systems are construed as dynamic open to their milieu, from the intracellular to the psychological, the biographical, the social and the cultural. Today, to deem something biological predicts not destiny, but opportunity. Hence, and this is the second of my conditions, the technologization of vitality in the life sciences, in which life seems to have become amenable to intervention, open to projects of control. Developments such as Ian Wilmot's cloning of Dolly, and Craig Venter's creation of Cynthia, a bacterial cell controlled by a chemically synthesized genome, have led some to suggest that nothing is biologically impossible, and only our own imagination and our own ethical and social constraints set the limits on what we can do to our vital existence. But even without such fantasies of omnipotence, a global bioeconomy has taken shape around the manipulation of biology. Biological knowledge has become highly capitalized and paths to the creation of biological truths have been shaped by the promises and predictions of the bio-value to be harvested. Companies, nations, and regions compete in a global bioeconomy which some hope will underpin a new industrial revolution. Just to take two examples, the global market for pharmaceuticals is around 500 billion US dollars a year, and that for medical devices, about 150 billion dollars a year. There's a lot of value in the work that we do to maintain ourselves as living beings. And that's my third condition, the salience that the biological and the biomedical has achieved in the practices of self-management and governance. We modulate our body and our minds with these drugs. We replace our worn out parts with the artificial hips and knees. We look up our symptoms on the internet. We check out our disease susceptibilities with personal genomic tests and body scans. We think about reducing our risks with diet, exercise. We worry individually and collectively about Alzheimer's and the dementias. And we take up Sudoku and mind gyms in the forlorn belief that if we act this way, we might be saved. We become 
become uh, what I've termed elsewhere somatic individuals. Along each of these dimensions, biology has become a crucial actor in our form of life. But before, bi beyond this biology as a social fact, many claim that these developments are remaking what it is to be human. As the old joke has it, the ultimate answer to the ultimate question of life, universe and everything is indeed 42, or rather 4 plus 2, the four bases of the genetic code, C, A, G and T, and the two digits of the binary code, 4 plus well, zeros and ones. I take this slide from my friend uh, Yang Hua Ming, who directs the Beijing Genomics Institute. Hyperbole apart, there is an ontological question here. Is our sense of who we are as human beings being remade by the contemporary life sciences? Is a new figure of the human emerging? And if so, with what consequences for our politics of life and for our disciplines of the human and social sciences? But first, let me say something about this occasion my delayed inauguration of the title awarded to me some five years ago. The Martin White Professorship in Sociology was established in 1904 with a donation from James Martin White, a Scottish landowner who was a Liberal MP for one brief year, a great supporter of education, there's a story behind that which I shan't say, a great supporter of educational ventures as well as it seems, of the pipe organ, and for many years a governor of the LSE. It's the oldest named chair of sociology in England. The first recipient of the chair was Edvard Vestermark, a Finn, whose first book, The Origins of Human Marriage, was published in 1891, although actually the history is a little bit more uh, complicated, as unearthed by my LSE colleague Chris Husbands. There were actually two chairs. One was temporary, was occupied by Vestermark part-time, because at the same time, he was professor of practical philosophy first at the University of Helsinki and later at Turku and uh, as an enticing precedent for his successors he spent a lot of his time in Morocco. Um, the other chair uh, was uh, occupied by Leonard Trelawney Hobhouse until his death in 1930. According to another LSE colleague, Terry Rantanen, uh, Westermark came to London at the invitation of Martin White, who, quote, as a member of Parliament, has observed that his fellow MPs were ignorant of sociology, a subject then not taught at any British university. White hoped that the provision of instruction of the subject in LS at LSE would eventually correct this parliamentary deficiency, although it's not clear whether he expected them to benefit from Vestermark's views on the relativity of moral judgment and the natural variation of human sexual orientation. Nonetheless, Hobhouse and Westermark gave their inaugural lectures as Martin White professors in 1907, and others who've held this chair, uh, I've uh, put some of them there, Morris Ginsburg, T.H. Marshall, David Glass. It was a great honor to be awarded the title on the retirement of my immediate uh, predecessor, Stan Cohen, and ever since then, I've been wondering what I might say to my adopted discipline of sociology that would be worthy of that heritage because I started out life as a baby biologist sometime last century. So my own work sits rather uneasily with that sociological heritage. I focused on the role of the positive knowledges of the human being, psychology, medicine, psychiatry, anthropology, sociology itself, in our societies and our identities. I've argued that at least in the countries of Europe, North America, and their colonies since the 19th century, these sciences have been fundamental to our forms of life and our ways of governing ourselves. They've shaped our conduct, divided the normal and the abnormal, and played a key role in managing those lives who live under the descriptions that they themselves have helped invent. Unemployables, degenerates, criminals, delinquents, the insane, the feeble-minded, not to mention the sick, the poor, and all the those they have divided into races. These truth discourses about human beings have been tied up with regimes of power. Their very existence and legitimacy as truthful discourses has depended on their capacity to underpin expertise and connect themselves with the governing of persons individually and collectively. 
And I believe these practices of government have helped constitute ourselves as certain kinds of persons, helped us understand what our nature is as human beings, how we're related to or differ from other human beings, how we should reflect upon our lives, how we should judge them, the very sense we give to notions such as autonomy, freedom, self-fulfillment. They've shaped what we might call after Max Weber our ethic, not so much our moral codes, but our way of steering ourselves through our lives, our Lebensführung. Now, perhaps these questions seem eccentric to the core of sociology, but I think sociology has always been entangled with these issues concerning the nature of the human being whose social lives uh, it analyzes. And as human beings came to think of themselves as essentially psychological creatures inhabited by a deep psychological space, the repository of their experience, the location of their character traits, and their passions, their madness, the targets of education and reform, despite the standoff between psychology and sociology, nonetheless this premise about what human beings were like was written into the very heart of the human and social sciences. The belief that, as Clifford Geertz famously put it a long time ago, man is an animal suspended in webs of significance that he himself has come. But as the 20th century came to the fore, I've argued, this way of thinking about ourselves as psychological beings came to be challenged by another. A way of thinking ourselves as biological, as somatic, a way of thinking of our flesh and our bodies and our health as central to ourselves, not perhaps in the way in which the Boston Women's Health Collective meant uh, four decades ago when they coined that slogan, our bodies, ourselves, but nonetheless in some central ways. Of course, there's nothing new in the way in which human beings have given a centrality to their health and their lives and their bodies, but what was new, I argue, is the way in which our flesh, our lives, our minds and our bodies came to be understood as a kind of intelligible biological machinery that could be treated, manipulated, simulated, even replaced as a result in, of advances in biomedicine. And as a result, I suggested the management of our bodies by us as individuals and those who exercise authority over us produce some radically new ways of steering ourselves through our lives, managing our earthly existence. And this was linked to multiple controversies over the extent to which we should exercise control over this or that aspect of our biology, new reproductive technologies, stem cell research, genetic screening, etc., etc., etc. Now, bookshelves grown under the weight of popular science discussing this new knowledge of our body and minds and speculating about the implications of our capacity to control everything uh, from our cognitive abilities to aging and death. And this is exacerbated by the rather doleful translational imperative which seems to require every researcher in the life sciences to come onto the Today programme and promise that the results of their research will be in the clinic within three to five years. This is a fantasy, of course. The more we know, the more we realize how little we know. Each dream of control over body and mind is soon met with downsides, side effects, disappointments, nowhere more than in my own special area, psychiatry and mental health. When it comes to human vitality, there's much that cannot be controlled. And as uh, my colleague on the journal Biosocieties, Jack Price, a neuroscientist who works at the Institute of Psychiatry, has recently argued in relation to his own specialism, brain damage, brain reconstruction in the face of damage from stroke, there's no simple trans, uh, golden path or progression from our ability to tackle simple problems to that needed to tackle complex ones. There are many distinct biological barriers that are hardly understood uh, let alone overcome. Nonetheless, despite the hype, despite the exaggeration, the idea that all living creatures can be understood in some way or other as biological, that their nature is not mystery but mechanism, lies at the heart of this claim that we have entered the century of biology. So what does that mean for the social sciences?
Biology and sociology, as anyone who can be bothered to consult the Oxford English Dictionary, let alone anywhere else, uh, will find out, were born close together in the first half of the 19th century. Biology in 1802 as a name for a new science of living entities, dividing nature into two kingdoms, those possessed of life and those without it. Sociology as the scientific study of the development of human societies conventionally ascribed to Comte in 1839, although it had been used earlier. From that moment of birth, sociology has been haunted by biology. Across the 19th century, there was a double movement. On the one hand, there was an attempt to differentiate the sciences of the moral or the social order from the biological, to argue that the laws of association amongst human beings were sui generis, but on the other hand, to model sociology on biology, to think of the social order as in some way analogous to the biological realm, with structures, functions, organic connections between parts, laws of development that could be described in the language of evolution, and having that potential that's only possible for living entities to be normal or pathological, to be healthy or sick. And the styles of contemporary biology infuse the social sciences at the same time as the social sciences uh, gained a status, at least in part because of their biopolitical role, by which I mean nothing more fancy than their claim to be able to provide the know-how to govern those aspects of individual or collective lives of human beings arising from their nature as living beings, racial types, sexual desire, procreation, disease and epidemics, and of course the whole problem of the population, consequences of differential fertility, degeneracy, eugenics. One only needs to list these for the intensity, the centrality of the biological and the social to become clear. This question of the biological and the social was central to sociology as it became a discipline in the first half of the 20th century. But what was sociology? Philip Abrams, writing 30 years ago, traces the repetitive crises of my adopted discipline to 1906 when he says, one could find as many divergent definitions of sociology as there were sociologists. Already one could hear loud complaints about the uselessness of this variety of sociology, the arid pedantry of that, the misty philosophizing of another, the political tendentiousness of yet another, that a social science was desirable but was widely agreed. But what was the social and what would be involved in studying it scientifically? Well, Abrams counts 61 definitions of sociology in the first three volumes of sociological papers, which were also, uh, uh, despite the best efforts of the Sociological Society, which was also funded by Martin White, the object of this discipline remained elusive. Leonard Trelawney Hobhouse gave his own answer to the question, what do we mean by sociology? It's a body of truth that would illuminate social understanding. Perhaps not very helpful. But perhaps, despite this vagueness, the sciences of sociology in the first half of the 20th century were still haunted by biology, not just because of the recurrence of those themes of evolution, etc., but because their recurrent question was a biological one. It was a question of population, and population was almost always addressed in terms of eugenics, though not in the way in which we think about it now. We can learn a little of this from the history of the LSE itself. Uh, William Beveridge uh, had argued before he became director of the LSE for the sequestration of unemployables in labor colonies and that they be de denied the right to reproduce. As director of the LSE from 1919 to 1937, he argued fiercely for the need for social biology, genetics, population, vital statistics, heredity, eugenics, and dysgenics in his wish to, quote, complete the circle of the social sciences. And he appointed Lancelot Hogburn, a biologist and a fierce opponent of the eugenicists, to a chair in social biology. He had toads here, which made him rather unpopular, uh, um, as well as being very critical of the economics taught here, um, using funds that were pro provided specifically for that purpose by the Laura Spellman Rockefeller Memorial Fund. 
According to Hogburn, Beveridge thought that the population problems could only be properly understood once the rubbish about allegedly biological laws of population growth, growth was sorted out. Quotes, human genetics was a morass of surmise and superstition. The rationalization of race prejudice by appeal to biological principles was plausible only because human genetics was so immature. But take Alexander Carr Saunders, who was the successor to Beveridge as director of the LSE from 1937 to 1955. Carr Saunders was co-author of a survey of the social structure of England and Wales, which was an eminently sociological text. And he was no ordinary eugenicist. He played a very large part in the establishment of higher education in the colonies. But he was centrally concerned with the problem of population. He was chairman of the Population Investigation Committee from 1936, chairman of the Statistics Committee of the Royal Commission on Population, and uh, president of the Eugenics Society between 1949 and 1953. In his little book on eugenics, published in 1926, he argued that eugenics was a science which concerned the part played by inheritance in human affairs. A long way, he said, from what's commonly understood by that term, which, quotes, calls to mind proposals for getting rid of persons with undesirable innate qualities and encouraging bringing into the world of well-endowed children. He uses a lot of evidence from social surveys to cast doubt on eugenics, but nonetheless, he argues, quote, the secession of selection, which is a consequence of our efforts to mitigate the lot of the less well endowed among us, may permit the survival of unfavorable mutations, and hence modern conditions may be allowing deterioration to occur. He wrote a book on young offenders, which he published in 1942, but in the same year he delivered the Hobhouse Memorial Lecture under the title, The Biological Basis of Human Nature. He made many criticisms of eugenics, but this is how he concluded. It's nearly 80 years since Galton set the eugenic movement on foot. He may have been over hasty, but it appears that we now have sufficient information upon which to take action, if we so wish. Dot, dot, dot. The Romans, it has been said, prided themselves on being the degenerate descendants of the gods. We pride ourselves on being the very creditable descendants of apes. We shall cease to be a credit to our ancestors if we allow our genetic inheritance to deteriorate. Four years later, John Maynard Keynes uh, presented Carl Saunders with the first Galton Medal, 1946. In 1946, Keynes described Carl Saunders as, quote, the founder of the most important, significant, and I would add genuine branch of sociology which exists, namely eugenics. Now, of course, from the 1950s onwards, things began to change in the light of the murderous consequences that seemed to be associated with conceiving human qualities in biological terms. Post-war continental philosophers argued that Nazi Germany was characterized by a spiritualization of the biological and a biologization of the spiritual, in which the person and body became seen as one and the central task of politics was that of shaping the biological life of the race, an animalization of human character, will, value, and virtue. Now, it's true that if sociologists read Talcott Parsons, they'll still see plenty of biological metaphors within Talcott Parsons. But nonetheless, both the molecular biologists of that time and the social scientists were trying at all costs to distance themselves from the field of biology, with, from the field of eugenics and all its associations. By the 1970s, it was sociological common sense that fatalism, determinism, reductionism, sexism uh, would follow inescapably from any engagement with human biology, either as an ontological question, what were humans really like, or as an epistemological one, what can, human, what can biology tell us about the forms of life that humans have made for themselves? Human biology was relevant only in that it provided the preconditions for language, meaning, and culture, whose form and content must be accounted for in non-biological terms. And all the controversies that followed 
about race and intelligence and all those other related matters seem to confirm that negative judgment on all those who imported vulgar biological notions into their diagnoses of social ills and their prescriptions for social policies. The evidence of two centuries seemed to place the biological for all time on the side of a reactionary politics that tied human beings to a fixed nature. To be progressive, to aim for social change, required keeping biology in its place. Now, as the 20th century came to a close, there were signs that this social, sociological common sense was coming into question. Firstly, no doubt, because of the salience of the biological itself in contemporary existence. It was centrally linked to feminist scholarship, which criticizes the sexual division of the Enlightenment in which women, by virtue of their bodies, were placed on the side of the irrational and men disembodied on the side of rationality. But paradoxically, this was followed with a fascination on the theme of embodiment. Although its focus on the body somehow elided that fleshly, bloody animal thing itself. The living body was more directly at issue in the many telling uh, feminist studies of reproductive biology, uh, re sorry, of reproductive technology, with their delicate tracings of the way in which biological knowledge was managed, lived, employed, contested, and intricated into the lives of women in reproduction, kinship, and parenthood. And this was studied by this was followed by a range of insightful studies of the new relations between biological knowledge, medical intervention, and and the management of bodies. We came to understand the ways in which the capacities of the body were shaped by cultural expectations, its normativities and pathologies were socially constructed, and features once considered natural, gender, sexuality, race, age, disability, were performed according to cultural scripts. Now, more recently, some participants in these debates have become critical of their overly discursive nature. They've argued for a turn to materialism, sometimes via the apparently radical recognition that non-human entities, from atomic particles to bacteria, have played an active role in human history. However, most of those who thought this way have taken their instruction from philosophy rather than from biology looking to Bergson, Merleau-Ponty, Whitehead, Deleuze, in order to develop a conceptual framework that, to use Karen Barad's phrase, can meet the universe halfway. And even the recent interest in the affects in the human sciences, while it sometimes refers to re research on bodies and emotions, prefers to turn to Spinoza rather than to neuroscience to anchor its arguments. It rarely refers to biological truth claims about processes in actual fleshly bodies and brains themselves. In another vein, there are a few within sociology who've argued against the premise that human bodies are infinitely plastic, malleable, shaped without constraint, and have argued for a new relationship between the social and the biological sciences, what some have termed a material corporeal sociology. But by and large, they remain a minority. Social psychologists and cognitive anthropologists have been happy to embrace uh, the apparent objectivity that molecular biology and neuroscience might give to them, perhaps in the hope that they'll gain a new respectability as a result. But most from the social and human sciences have fought against the incursion of biology into social analysis. They've spurned the self-proclaimed openness of biological thought to social factors. So that's where we now stand. And in the second part of this lecture, I'd like to ask the question on that, after that rather long preface, where, or perhaps better, how should the social sciences be concerned with biology today? Of course, even in the 1970s and 1980s, there were some who wrote with great insight about these issues, avoiding reductionism and determinism, and one of those, someone I've already mentioned, Paul Hurst. It was certainly unusual to open an introductory sociology book with the words of an evolutionary biologist, 
but Social Relations and Human Attributes, which Paul wrote with Penny Woolley and published in 1982, does just that. It opens with a quote from Theodosius Dobzhansky, written in 1955. Human society and culture, he says, are the product of the biological evolution of our species. But yet, human phenomena, and he mentions intelligence, the capacity to use linguistic symbols and culture, affect the biological evolution of man so profoundly that it cannot be understood without taking them into account. Human evolution, is, own, is wholly intelligible only as an outcome of biological and social facts. And this is the central theme of Hurst and Woolley's arguments. Human attributes are, as they put it, directly conditional upon man's animal past. Even human physical attributes, such as bipedalism, opposable finger and thumb, the size and capacities of the human brain, arise from selection pressures from emerging very human forms of life. And yet as humans develop their distinctive cultural forms, their attributes, whether that's how they comport their body in marching, in walking, in swimming, through the manifestations of distress in physical or mental uh, symptoms and syndromes, to a sense of personhood itself, the idea of human beings as individuals, unique and autonomous, all these have been socially shaped. And as the anthropologists of the first half of, our of the 20th century showed us, very greatly between cultures and across historical time. Indeed, some attributes that we think of as quintessentially human, speaking, sexuality, the sense of self, do not appear at all in the absence of social and cultural shaping, as all those stories about wild children brought up by wolves or incarcerated in cellars demonstrate very clearly. The bodily capacities and mental capacities of humans require social formation. The envelope of the skin does not define by right an enclosed autonomous zone. It cannot be the province of the biologists alone, even when it comes to the organization of basic musculature, of hormonal systems, and even of life or death. Now, in the 30 years or so since Hurst and Woolley published that book, these arguments have become even more telling. In our molecular age, these relations of the social and the biological, both the selection pressures that human life exerted on human evolution and the shaping of human attributes by their milieu have been reposed in molecular terms. Starting perhaps in the 1930s, we moved from a molar image of life, of organs, flows of organs, muscles, blood, tissue, as represented in the images of dissection on one side of the screen here, towards a molecular image of life a gaze that envisages the body at a radically new level, at the scale of interactions between events, activities, and uh, functions that happen between molecules. In contemporary styles of thought, notably in the area of my own current research, neuroscience, biology and culture are not construed as realms external to one another. Rather, human biology and human sociality, bodies, brains, and milieu, are in multiple transaction at the molecular level. Consider, for example, the style of thought in the area that terms itself social neuroscience. <coughs> Researchers in this area seek to account for the distinctively social form of human existence by identifying evolutionary processes that have selected for the neural preconditions of sociality, of group formation, and even of consciousness. Such advantageous capacities, they, su they suggest, have their conditions in specific molecular sequences, in genetic uh, sequences that code for neurobiological processes that subserve human sociality. Now, many from the social and human sciences react with horror to this suggestion that our human social capacities have neurobiological bases. They feel that their space is being colonized, their expertise is being displaced. Instead of understanding humans as uniquely speaking subjects, this reduces them to mere puppets of their brains. 
in claiming that the relations between our forms of life and those of our animal forebears may not be those of fundamental distinction but of continuity, they suggest. We forget that only humans can express these relations, communicate them to others, build systems of morality and civility upon them, uphold them in the face of all that would once more reduce the human to the status of animal as mere, quote, cockroaches, or, quote, dogs, or, quote, vermin, to use some both historical and contemporary terms, in order to exterminate them. Now, I understand these arguments. No one who's looked at the history of biological thought can fail to understand them. But I find them unconvincing. Of course, there are plenty of examples of simplistic reductionism, uh, notably in the branch of social neuroscience that relies on brain imaging. The over-interpretation of results uh, from experiments in highly artificial laboratory situations, the quotes blobology that claims that an area of the brain that shows activity in a brain scanner, an area that, by the way, contains billions of neurons at the current uh, level of resolution, is the location for this or that human mental state and which attempts to leap over the explanatory gap between brain events and mental events by sleight of hand or misleading metaphors. This is a classic example of what Gerd Gigerenza a long time ago referred to as tools to theories. A tool produces a certain output, a theory is created around that output, and then it takes on a life of its own which each image uh, seems to confirm. And of course, those from the social and human sciences rightly identify the impoverished sense in which social relations are reduced to the interpersonal relations between dyads, notably of university students, uh, that can be experimentally simulated in a way that's familiar to us from the long history of experimental social psychology. <clears throat> but I think to write off social neuroscience on the basis of such uh, lamentable uh, endeavours would be misleading. Just to take one example, John Cacioppo, who's got a good claim to have uh, invented the term social neuroscience, has worked for the last 30 years on what he takes to be an evolved human affinity for social life and the consequences of isolation. Quotes, the social environment, says Cacioppo, is fundamentally involved in the sculpting and activation or inhibition of basic structures and processes in the human brain and biology. Social isolation or perceived social isolation, that is loneliness, gets under the skin to affect social cognition and emotions, personality processes, brain, biology and health. Close quote, a preeminently culturally shaped human experience, not just actual isolation, but perceived isolation, symbolic isolation, culturally shaped isolation, configures neural processes at the molecular level, and vice versa. If this isn't an invitation to the social and human sciences, I don't know what is. In Cacioppo's work, humans can indeed be dying for company. Now, some suggest that this molecular vision of life takes us beyond vitalism. We no longer need any special theories to understand what life consists in. The complexity of living systems can be broken down into simple, understandable, engineerable, describable interactions between specific kinds of parts. Vital processes can be reverse engineered, their parts and their properties can be freed from their origins and reassembled like Lego bricks, first in thought and then in reality, to produce whatever entity you can dream up. You take green fluorescence from here, the ability to live at 200 degrees centigrade from there, the capacity to digest oil from elsewhere, you insert them into your organism of choice, and there you have it, a green, heat-loving oil eater. Now, I've referred to this as a flat ontology of life, 
That is to say, everything can be connected up with everything else through certain circuits. And perhaps its apotheosis is in synthetic biology, this vision that vital processes can be seen as assemblies of parts specified by their gene sequences. They can be fabricated and connected together to make something completely new to create the organism <coughs> that evolution forgot. Now, I talked earlier about the fantasy of biological control that some extrapolate from this idea of life as pure mechanism. And if we pause for just a moment on synthetic biology, we can see how misleading this is. As Rob Carlson recently pointed out in a book called Biology is Technology, <clears throat> a Boeing 747 like the one I was on a couple of days ago, which is why I have this terrible cough, excuse me. A Boeing 747 consists of about 50,000 kinds of parts, some 6 million total components, and the precise specification of each part is known and described quantitatively in advance. A relatively simple cell, for example a yeast cell, has millions of moving parts, most of which are unknown, approximately 6,300 kinds of genetic parts, of which we can name about half, but for almost all of them we have no design specifications at all, not to mention all the other parts that are involved, the structures of sugars and lipids, for example, that aren't encoded in the genome, and we've got only the slightest idea of how they work. A human body has something like 10 to the 14 or 100 trillion cells, like yeast cells, not to mention all the microbes that inhabit us. And as for the human brain, one estimate suggests that it contains about 100 billion neurons, each of which are different, with 100 trillion synapses or connections between them. You have to be a banker to understand these billions and trillions. So one task for social science is to look beyond the hyperbolic form in which some scientific activities are presented to work closely with the actual researchers and explore their operative philosophy. And we'll find this much more hesitant, much more modest, and much more open to a uh, genuine conceptual engagement. Now the same is true of genomics. As I'm sure everybody here knows, genomics has moved from a deterministic paradigm, looking for single genes for everything, every characteristic, to a probabilistic paradigm, uh, in which multiple small molecular variations shape major differences in the way in which an organism develops its environment, develops in its environment, not only between species, but also between individuals in the same species. Once more, there's a lot of hype about the extent to which these relations are understood, but again, we need to move beyond this to grasp the new vision of the human that's taking shape. On the one hand, at the genomic level, researchers are finding multiple remarkable continuities between even simple animals and humans, and yet when it comes to multicellular organisms, let alone primates, the genome is not the book of life or the code of codes, not the digital instructions for making an organism, but something rather different. Jacques Monod was wrong when he asserted famously that what was true for E. coli was also true for the elephant. The challenge is to understand that difference if we're to have a real feel for the organism. Now some of you may know it's 10 years since the draft sequence of the human genome was published, and to mark that point, the eminent genome scientist Eric Lander published in Nature a couple of weeks ago a review of where we've got to. And he pointed to our growing realization of how much we now know that we do not know. Whilst only about 1.5% of the genome contains the classical genes, the protein coding sequences, there's a further 6% that's evolutionary conserved, so must be biologically functional, but it doesn't code for proteins. Millions of conserved elements whose function we don't know. Perhaps it's for regulation of development, of transcription, etc., etc., etc. There are thousands of other sequences that, that have unknown roles in such processes as cell cycle regulation, immune response, uh, brain processes. Genome sequences are one-dimensional, but chromosomes are three-dimensional. We know nothing, very little, about the implications of configuration. We may be just beginning to understand the implications of the so-called single nucleotide 
polymorphisms in genes, but we know even less about the effect of all sorts of other variations. For instance, copy number variations, where whole genetic sequences are duplicated. We're moving away from the idea that you can find simple gen uh, genetic similarities amongst common complex disorders. And even in conditions where we have a clear idea of heritability, such as certain forms of breast cancer, the proportion explained by what we know of genomics is small. The so-called missing heritability when you've done all your genome-wide association studies, which may range from 50%, that is to say we can only understand 50% of the variation in why people get, uh, say, a macular degeneration, to something like 95% in some other conditions, and so on. The more we know, the more we don't know. And the more we know, the more we find ourselves moving away from the idea that the genome is the prime mover, the uncaused cause, and towards a style of thought that sees the genome as much affected and shaped by all that's around it as it shapes it. The recognition of the inseparability of vitality and milieu does open a new role, in my view, from this, for the social and human sciences. Take the very well-known work of Michael Meany and his colleagues. Uh, Meany and his group have worked from the 1980s on the effect of early experiences on, re on rodent behavior, um, what, on what is now called epigenetic programming. The mother's behavior towards her pup shapes the expression of genes through altering methylation. This shapes neuronal development in the pup. Hence, it shapes the pup's own behavior towards its offspring. By 2009, Meany and his group were suggesting that these findings could be translated to humans. There were common effects of variations in maternal care on epigenetic regulation in stressed rodents and in suicide victims with a history of child abuse. The brain, it seems, no less than the psyche before it, is open to environmental inputs, but yet in another blow to genetic determinism, there is no one-way traffic between genotype and phenotype. But there are constant transmissions modulating gene expression with consequences that might flow down the generations. How should we react? Should we, from the social and human sciences, react with horror to such arguments? I don't think so. Is it, a con is it a threat to our conceptual and moral delineations of the human that stressed rodents? Mm -hmm. Oh, there they are. That stressed rodents might share something with stressed human beings? I don't think so. Should we work with these researchers to understand the strengths and weaknesses of their animal models? To seek to model more closely the effects of history, culture, and sociality? to guard against the rush to immediate translation into policy and practice. Yes, that would be a way of revitalizing sociology that would not threaten it, in my view, but bring it once more into alignment with the positive knowledges of the creatures whose relations we seek to analyze and perhaps even to improve. So in all these areas of the life sciences, despite their differences, a style of thought is emerging of constant transactions across the apparent boundaries of the organism that constitute shape and support vitality at time scales from the millisecond to the decade, at levels from the molecular to the cellular to the organism itself. Of course, this thought style operates in many different ways, and of course, there's no single relationship that the human sciences and social sciences might have to them. But one thing is clear, it's not going to be in terms of some generic relationship between those two enticing yet illusory totalities, the body and society. Now, I think this relationship should be as fruitful for the life scientists as for the social scientists. Um, I put three areas on the brain thinking, three areas on the slide, thinking naively I might have a little bit of time to talk about each of them, where I've worked a little bit myself neuroscientific arguments about the adolescent brain, neuroscientific arguments about the early signs of criminal traits, neuroscientific arguments about the use of biomarkers to diagnose psychiatric disorders. I think in all those three areas and more, areas that are having 
very significant consequences for social and legal policy. There is a real need for the social scientists to understand and engage and criticize and extend and deepen the kinds of analyses that are going on here. But despite the warnings of those who fear the consequences of placing humans amongst the animals, I believe that this opportunity for engagement places a certain demand on us that's both conceptual and ethical. Not that we give up responsibility for that which is biological or deny that it has pertinence for our own investigations, but that we take responsibility for the biological, for the social shaping of the bodies and brains that constitute us as specifically human animals whose welfare, in some ways, we might hope to foster. I've gone on too long, <clears throat> so I'd like to move to... Uh, Conclusion. Should we rush to our philosophers to seek a new way of conceptualizing these relations? Some find that attractive, I know, but I prefer uh, to follow my mentor, Michel Foucault, and to undertake what he would call field work in philosophy. To look not to philosophers of biology, but to the operative philosophy of the biologists themselves, amongst whom I've spent much of the last uh, few years, but there is one philosopher who might help us, I think, and this is Georges Canguillem, uh, Michel Foucault's uh, teacher. In one of his characteristically enigmatic statements, the French philosopher and historian of biological thought, Can Georges Canguillem, remarked, the thought of the living must take from the living the idea of the living, which means, I think, that at every historical moment, the way we think about how we should think about vitality must be informed by, shaped by, premised on the very ways in which vitality itself is understood in the sciences of life. Our relationship to the forms of knowledge generated by the life sciences cannot remain indifferent to that knowledge, cannot treat it merely as one set of knowledge claims amongst others. Yes, of course, we are very good these days at identifying the conditions of possibility of our regimes of truth about life, of seeing how they structure the very rationality of the life sciences, and also of our experience of ourselves and of ourselves in our present. We are very good at tracing the paths that they set for the development of biology, biomedicine and biotechnology and the way in which the human vitality itself has become a domain of intervention and the production of bio-value. We can also identify what those truths about ourselves, our lives, our world make possible and preclude, and there's much to be critical of here. And criticism should itself be engaged, be engaged in trying to redirect those pathways in the service of life and not just of profit. But all truth claims have conditions, and our elegant descriptions of the way in which our current biological truths are being created isn't sufficient, or at least it's not sufficient for me. In another of his suggestive phrases, George Canguillem <coughs> remarks that every mode of biological reason is in a certain way also a philosophy of life. A philosophy of life because our way of li living our sense of how we should live as humans, of why we should live as humans, of what we owe to ourselves and others, of what we can know, of what we should do, of what we can hope for. All of these have become tangled up in what we think we are as living creatures and what we think about our relation to other living creatures in the world in which we inhabit. Now, as I said, there are some who claim that these developments embody an engineering idea of life have put the final stake in the heart of vitalism, that we now live in a fully disenchanted world in which we realize that vitality is merely the intelligible result of physical, chemical, mathematical, stochastical processes. Now, of course, we've developed remarkable powers to intervene in our bodies, to replace our parts, to modulate our vital systems with drugs, and so on. As for our brains, we've got a very long way to go, but in any event, I don't think simple mechanistic reductionism does or will characterize the operative philosophy of the sciences of life. 
as they develop across the 21st century, I don't think we'll come to regard humans or other living organisms as merely machines open to our fantasies of total control, even if that may be the tone of some popular pronouncements. Vitalism, and this is something that Kangyam taught us as well, should remain as a constant reminder of the self-organizing, dynamic, self-regulating complexity of living systems. The fact that unlike machines, they exist and develop in time and space and the inseparability of organism and milieu in the real world. The social and human sciences need to grasp these operative philosophies, to explore the philosophies of life they embody and the potential forms of life to which they may be linked. But more than this, we need to grasp the crucial role of our own disciplines in understanding the shaping, the all too frequent cramping of human vitality and to engage with the scientists and to play our own part in ensuring that the vital futures that are taking shape address the local, national and global inequities that devastate the vital lives of so many of our fellow citizens. Now there are many good historical reasons why those in the social and human sciences who consider themselves progressive have been highly critical of attempts to build a positive relation with the life sciences. But I suggest that this dread of reductionism, determinism, locating humans among the animals is now misplaced. The question that we have to confront, I suggest, is how to configure a new relationship with biology, one in which we both recognize the provisionality of the knowledge claims in the life sciences and have a kind of affirmative relationship to the new, open, dynamic relations between the vital and its milieu that is taking shape. This requires us to recognize that the social and human sciences are also sciences of the living. And in my view, we must move beyond description, commentary, and critique, beyond the study of downstream implications to insubordination or subservience to the wonders of science, some wide-eyed embracing of every latest pronouncement let alone the displacement of our own hard-won expertise into the process of social shaping of human lives. In truth, it's hard to know how such a relationship might turn out. Um, that's harder to swallow, but might be even more important in the ways it reconfigures the relationships between humans and animals, humans and matter, humans and their milieu. <clears throat> Some of you may also remember Michel Foucault's words at the end of the order of things. The figure of the human, whose uniqueness was the organizing principle of knowledge and morality, he argued, was held together by a certain historical a priori, which made the human a unique and privileged place as both the subject and the object of positive knowledge. It was the unspoken premise, the uniqueness of the human was the unspoken premise of the human sciences. For Foucault, it was the advent of structuralism that would transform this framework, displacing the figure of the human from the throne that he had, he had built on the premise of our uniqueness. Almost half a century later, it's not to structuralism, I think, but the life sciences that we should look if a new figure of the living is taking shape. And if a new figure of the living is taking shape, if facing the old like a face drawn in sand at the edge of the sea, what part might the human and social sciences themselves play in the new figure of the human that is being born? That, I think, is the challenge for those who hope to revitalize our own disciplines for the 21st century. Thank you for your attention. very um, wide-ranging, stimulating, controversial, all of those things lecture, just as it should be. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes for questions and discussion, and there are mics 
around and I wonder if you could put your hand up so they can get lined up and um, right, someone down here, perhaps you could just say your name um, before you speak. Sorry, there's one there. Do I see another hand? This one. And there's one there. Okay. Will we take two? You want to yeah. take two together or one? Well, let's take let's one. Take one. Um, yeah. oh, okay. Jan McBarish from the University of Kent. I'm not clear whether you're arguing that um, some sociologists ought to engage in a critical and friendly relationship with um, the most uh, advancing uh, neuroscientists and those that aren't kind of uh, expanding their claims beyond their, their knowledge at present, and, um, or whether you're saying that all sociology um, needs to uh, orient itself in this direction. I wasn't clear, because you, you'll talk about reinvigorating sociology through this engagement. It seems to me much more than uh, just a kind of partial uh, and critical engagement with a new area of science. Oh, it would be far too... Uh ambitious of me to try and uh, reconfigure the whole of sociology. Um, but I do think that if uh, those working in many different areas begin to recognize that sociology and the human sciences more generally are sciences of the living, that certain things might begin to change. Certain of the ways in which sociology has characterized over the last 50 years some of its most fundamental questions. Let's take a very basic one, the inter intergenerational transmission of social deprivation. Or to take a, another question, uh, the outrageous global inequalities in uh, um, uh, life expectancy at birth. Or to take uh, another one, uh, the ways in which um, the, ph the pharmaceuticalization, if I can call it that, of human existence takes some problems as central and takes other problems as not central. Okay, we can look at many of those questions without recognizing that the entities on which these uh, practices operate are living human beings, but I think we go quite a lot further and perhaps quite a lot deeper if we realize that what's at stake is more than just a, a layer of culture. It's the very form of living itself, questions of global inequality. And as I said right at the very beginning, central to our biopolitics is, I think, this idea that all humans, no matter what distinguishes them, have one thing in common, and that is that they are living creatures, and they deserve to be treated as living creatures as such. Is that not what evokes those enormous outpourings of, of, of anger and, and, uh, and sympathy when we see our fellow living creatures dying of HIV and AIDS or uh, starving, starving to death? It is at least in part because they are living creatures. And I know that we can be, to some extent, we can be cynical about that, but I think perhaps about the emotion that, that those kinds of images draw forth from us. But I think they should be treated as topics for investigation rather than for critique. Mm. Okay, well, one there, one there, and then one behind. Okay. Uh, just here. Can we take these three together? Okay, yeah. Yeah, well, why don't we just take these three together, yeah? Uh, thank you for your speech. Uh, so one question that I sometimes uh, concern is that we human beings are more like social animals and, and not anymore like <coughs> basic biological animals is some question that involves evolutionary biology. So I think that the, or like genes of gay and lesbian in terms of evolutionary biology or you know, natural, uh, natural selection or sexual selection. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rose, for giving the talk this evening. Um, I, you had mentioned the, well, I mean, ultimately, the closening of the social sciences to the human sciences. I was wondering if you got any sort of impression that any uh, similar conversation or analogous conversation is going on within the human sciences, or is this something that uh, the social sciences, this is something that we need to confront head on and is there like a reciprocal voice coming back from the human sciences? And then behind, yeah. Emmanuel Uigo, LSE Ideas. 
I'm curious about your views of fMRI work because I've been following this that certain emotions trigger activity in the prefrontal cortex or the amygdala. I think it's quite useful. The problem is that the device is designed for use for just one individual. So in so far as economics focuses on individual decision-making processes, it's more suited for that kind of social science work instead of sociology where you have more interaction. Would advances in fMRI machines that allow multiple individuals to interact solve your problem with fMRI work? Okay, can I take those three? Yeah. yeah can please, I yeah. take them in reverse order, if I may? Um, so the question about fMRI is precisely the question, that, or the kind of question that seems to me to absolutely demand the sort of dialogue which I've been with setting out a kind of manifesto, a manifesto for. Um, and I think there are many, many different reasons for that. Um, the first is, as you say, that uh, fMRI uh, work currently, at least, looks at human beings isolated one at a time in very expensive, very noisy machines in laboratory situations, playing artificial games um, and observing the patterns of activation in their brains that change when they're playing and not playing those games, and then making... Uh, it seems to me quite excessively uh, baroque interpretations of the of the results. Um, how human beings' brains operate in social situations is, I think, pretty much unknown to contemporary fMRI work. As indeed is the sort of uh, is the way in which one might get beyond. And I know many people who do that brain imaging are trying to get beyond what I refer to rather uh, dismissively as blobology. That is to say that because you see the activation in one particular brain region, you begin to believe that that brain region is the locus that is specialized for that particular kind of activity. I mean, just because a particular region of a car engine heats up when the car is going along, that does not mean that that is the motion center of the car. That's the, not the motion center. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, our levels of, uh, of resolution in fMRIs are... are uh, at many, many scales uh, below the levels of actual brain activity. About a billion neurons are in every voxel of your fMRI scan. So if you're actually interested in what's going on at the neuronal level, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Does that mean that this capacity to see what is happening or to in some way or other visualize what's happening in, in the human living brain. Does it mean it's nothing? No, of course it's not nothing. It's a tremendously powerful tool. Does it mean we have a picture of activity in the living brain? No. Talk to any brain imager, and I can see one right in front of me. Uh, talk to any brain imager, and, or go and see the brain imaging being done, and you'll know that this is a picture which is not like the picture of a photograph. It's not even like the picture of a structure structural scan, it is something completely different. So here is where I think that social scientists, with a knowledge of the technology, with a good relationship with the researchers, with an understanding of the context in which human activities are carried out, can enter into those kinds of dialogues. So that's what I'd say. I'd talk for much more, but I don't have time. Um, I think there are debates. I, I wasn't quite sure what you meant by the human sciences. And the distinction between the human sciences, the social sciences, and within all the social sciences is tremendously blurry. If you mean by the human sciences the arts and so on, then I think there is a great and perhaps overgreat interest in brain imaging in the arts at the moment, in trying to identify the neural basis of aesthetic appreciation and so on and so forth. Often, it seems to me, entranced by the images in the, in the brain, from the brain scanner. Does that mean that we should not, that it some way or other diminishes our sense of what is beautiful or what we appreciate aesthetically in music, in images, by knowing, by understanding the brain processes which, in, which are activated by seeing or hearing? Is that somehow a threat to some ineffable human creativity? that can only kind of valorize itself if it has nothing to do with our existence as, as living creatures. No, I don't think it is. If the other part of your question was, are the scientists, are the brain imagers, are the geneticists, 
are they uh, epi the people working on epigenetics, epigenetics, are they reaching out to the social sciences? Well, I think in a sense they have opened an opportunity for us. And to some extent they have reached out a hand to us, but I don't see very many of us grasping that hand, even if critically. And that's what my little <laughs> manifesto uh, today was supposed to say. Don't give up your criticisms. Don't give up. Your, your recognition that many, many human attributes are not in any simple way the product of evolution that's selected for selfish genes, because if you do so, you'll come up with some very contorted explanations of human sexuality, of, of homosexuality, of gays and lesbians, and so on and so forth. Of course, our human attributes are fundamentally culturally shaped, and that's the same with our sexuality. It's fundamentally culturally shaped. And to say it's culturally shaped is not to say that it doesn't, sh that what's happening is not the shaping of our biology at these very fundamental levels. I think it is the shaping of our biology at these very fundamental levels. And I think those, at those very fundamental molecular levels, those things are shaped in ways that one is beginning, at least beginning to understand how social experiences get under the skin, to use that term that's very frequently used. I think if we turn our back, if we social scientists turn our back, or if we social scientists think that everything is like the, the naive simplifications of evolutionary psychology and doctrines of the selfish gene, then we won't get very far in this, uh, in this debate, which I would like to try and encourage. <coughs> You want to take one more? Oh, well, there's loads more, oh, actually. Okay. All right. Um, actually, I was wanting to ask you some of these okay. things, but I won't, actually. Can we Sorry. Take, can I take Tom at the back as Tom, well? Yes, OK. The two, which one? This one? This, that, that this chap, chap there, that chap there. Then the, the, then the chap, chap of blue. And then we'll come back to the other two. Yeah. Okay. Um, I greatly enjoy that. Uh, very interesting. Uh, my question is very simple, which is, can you hear? Uh, in what name is the sociologist speaking? Um, who, are you, who, are you speaking who are you speaking for? Uh, we know that an MRI scientist is speaking in, you know, for the brain, but what is the sociologist actually speaking for? Not society? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, in the name of what uh, are we sociologists supposed to be providing explanations? Because Nicholas, you know, your, your, your talk, which I thought was wonderful, was, was quite critical of ideas about commentary and critique and so forth, and yet actually a hell of a lot of it was about critique and commentary and, and trying to uh, sort of undo some of the, the, the biological sciences and say, well, they're not deterministic and so forth. And that, that seems to me to be a terribly important uh, function of the social sciences, precisely to be doing exactly that commentary and critique. Uh, and I didn't see an alternative kind of explanatory structure coming out of, of, of sociology that you were outlining, that you know, we're speaking in the name of society or something like that. So what are sociologists speaking in the name of? I suppose that, that's my central question. Can we take the chap in the, in the light yeah. blue here while you think about it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, take. Hi, uh, Wait, Emmett Soldati, I'm a student in sociology. Uh, sort of a similar question. You talked about the, how Eric Lander's sort of uh, noted how much we don't know, and the more we know about the human genome, the more we realize we don't know. I was sort of wondering the converse of that in terms of does sociology have the same mechanism in which the more we learn, the more we don't know and have and know that we need to know? Because um, it seems that, I mean, Eric Lander still certainly knows his next task, knows his next research project to sort of fill in a little bit of that very minute uh, sort of piece of uh, information. Does sociology have the same thing, or do we then need biology to to figure out what we don't know. Okay. You want to take one more? All right. Um, related? Yeah. <laughs> two, two. I mean, very challenging questions. Yeah. Look, if if I knew the answer to the que all the questions that you're asking me, I wouldn't have put this uh, lecture together. Um, if I didn't think it was worth a wager, I wouldn't have uh, 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 detained you here for an hour and a half. Um, the second question tempts me to a critique of my own adopted discipline of sociology. 
Does sociology know what it doesn't know? Does sociology build on the past? Is sociology a discourse organized around truth and shaped by the elimination of error? All those things that one might say. I, I have a particular view of scientific discourse. I don't share the view of many of my colleagues in science and technology studies that says that what we've come to call science is equivalent in all ways to, what, to any other form of discourse. Science is not a mere, I don't even like the term science with a capital S, but forgive me because time is tight. The sciences are not merely reflections on the world. What we've come to call science, bind together reflections on the world and attempts to dream up in reality what you've already dreamed up in thought. That is to say, an experimental moment. An experimental moment. I think that experimental moment, which is, the, it seems to me, the, at the root of the dynamism in science, at the root of its recognition that it's very difficult to make things true. Not as some of my, S sorry, Judy, not as some of my SDS colleagues seem to think that it's very easy to make things true. It's very difficult to make things true. In sociology, if I was going to be very glib about it, I would say it's all too easy to make things true. It's all too easy to talk things into the truth. And if there could be something like an experimental moment in sociology, it might be quite a good idea. Professor Osborne, in whose name uh, do we, in whose name do we speak? Well, I'd like, to, I'd like to say we speak in the name of life, in the name of living, in the name of what it is as living human creatures, and in a peculiar way to recognize something that I think was recognized, how in whatever horrific form it took in eugenics and so on, that idea of humans as vital creatures, living, reproducing, in populations, shaping their biological comportment through their social interactions and so on and so forth. If, I, if one speaks in any name, I suppose it is speaking in the name, in, in that name. What role is there for sociology I think the role of sociology is always, no, let me put this in another way. Okay, nothing is written in the development of the life sciences. I have a kind of path dependent view as to how truth develops in the life sciences. They can go marching off in all sorts of different directions. Of course, in many ways, normed by their own failure, as we saw in the early fantasies of the, of the, of the genome as the code of codes and the, book of, of the books of life. There is, it's not written anywhere that the life sciences will move in this open, dynamic, interactive, vitalism in its media kind of direction. That's not written. And whether it takes those paths or whether they take a simplistic, reductionist, determinist path, I think has something in some tiny little way, some tiny minuscule little way, since the social scientists don't have so much traction in the world, some tiny minuscule little way to do with the social scientists and how they themselves work in these situations. Yes, critique, yes, constant awareness and critique of those simplifications, but why not just latch on to those tiny parts that seem to us to open the space to those things that we've known for a very long time. We've known for a really, we didn't need neuroscience to tell us that early childhood experience had consequences way beyond, etc. We didn't need brain imaging to tell us that. We knew that and we have some very good accounts of that coming from the social sciences themselves. So let's latch on to those places where we can have those dialogues. Let's not say that everything that comes out in the latest uh, pronouncement from, um, from the genome scientists or whatever has to be treated as unassailable, as unassailable truth. Let's learn enough about what's going on to be able to engage critically. In the answer to the earlier question about the human sciences, I suppose what I meant to say, and I can't even remember now if I, if I said it, was that what I would really like and really hope for would, that would be that there would be a critical mass of people on the other side of this, in the neurosciences, in molecular biology, in molecular genetics, who didn't just hand wave towards the environment and gene times environment interactions and all those kinds of things, but actually did demand, not just hope, but demand that uh, our expertise, such as it was, was engaged. There are a few of them, I know some of them, I've been fortunate to work with some of them, 
and there's certainly some younger people who work that way, so I think there's an opportunity that's open, otherwise I wouldn't, as I said, have taken up an hour and a half of your time uh, this evening. Yeah. 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 Um, I know there are, there are many other questions and it's been a fantastic and stimulating lecture and there are loads of things that people want to ask, including myself. Uh, but I think as it's um, drawing to 8 o'clock, I'd like to um, thank Nicholas for a marvellous lecture and also to invite you all to come and have a drink with us, both to kind of celebrate the lecture and perhaps also have a drink for the um, centenary of International, International Women's, Women's Day. Day. Yes, yeah. so on both those scores. And I'd like to thank Nicholas now for a wonderful lecture. Thank you.